Um, I'm really grateful to be here and grateful to be in this role. Uh, if any of you are wondering what the newest faculty member, uh, what business he has telling us all about being well, I've asked myself the same question. So I, I, uh, but I'm really excited. Every department now has been asked to have a wellness uh, champion or representative to disseminate these uh, resources and tools and then just to make it at a department level um, focus. So uh, anyway, I, I, I think we have tons of resources already here at the Moran. We have a wonderful culture that we're building upon. Um, but I think this is great to just increase awareness and, t and just talk about this more often, not only amongst ourselves, but especially amongst our teams. I think this uh, just makes everything better, the patient satisfaction, physician satisfaction, team cooperation. So. Let me see if I can get this. More time here. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. My day to the rescue. <laughs> While Renee's looking at that, I just want to make a comment. I, um, uh, I have a cousin of mine is actually a psychiatrist in town, um, and he, he used to say the worst thing you could ever say to somebody who was depressed, and I think you could translate also to burnout, is to buck up. I thought that was really fascinating. He said that that, 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 that would be just demoralizing. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, Tom Oding at the recent AUPO meeting who's the uh, program director, residency program director at Iowa, he said the first thing that we look at in a resident who is lazy and not performing well is depression. So I, I, just, I, I, I thought these were just great comments about the way that we talk about each other, the way that we talk about performance and uh, the encouragement we give, sometimes seemingly trying to be helpful, telling somebody to buck up and, and be better, or coming down on, on a resident who maybe not be performing at the level you would hope for. Um, yeah, that was the that was the PC. Oh, here. the last one. Yeah. Okay. Are you feeling um, stressed right now? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, I, I'm just ticking like a clock. <laughs> the um, so I, you know actually while we're while I'm working that, uh, we'll, we'll jump into this though, but the um. Uh, um, let me just ask you a question. What, what is it about the culture of medicine that stifles wellness? So, you know, I, I, I got a few of us a little older to remember. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that, that um, literally there was a badge of courage uh, about um, how little sleep, how many hours, and how little time you spent doing anything else in medicine. And uh, there, there, there was clearly culture, and, uh, and, and it still exists, even though, you know, I can remember when it was, it was largely male gender, and it's much more balanced today, but the, it is, was there was this macho culture that uh, if you're tough, you do, you just buck it up, and that it's a sign of weakness, almost a failing, if you complain, if you admit that you're having difficulties or problems, if you, in, in, in any way, you know, seek out or reach for help or is somehow a sign of a failure of you as an individual. And uh, that's certainly the culture that I remember, you know, from my period of time in training, and we're talking 40 plus years ago now for me. But, but I, I sense that, and I'll ask, I mean, isn't that a sense even in residents that there's still that, that same old mindset about just buck it up? You know, if you, if you're, if you show any sign that there's difficulty or problems, you're just not, you're just not cutting. You're not man enough, you know, to, to go ahead and continue along. And, and that has been incredibly destructive, and I think underlies so much of the difficulty and problems we have today. Because that, that is not smart. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's a stupid approach to this overall effort, and it's sadly we're paying the price. And we have for a long time. If you look at numbers, whereas a profession, we've often been very satisfied with 
but our, our marital discord and divorce rates have been way off the scale. Our suicide rates have been extremely high. I mean, there's been a huge personal price that has occurred for that type of culture and mindset. And uh, I, it's time for that to change. And it's time for us to commit that we don't buy into that here at the United Center. And we don't accept the Chesapeake correction rates. That we are very concerned about work life balance. And they want, we want people to understand that we consider that right. I remember the head of Johns Hopkins once mentioning to a resident, he talked about the fact that he wasn't going to get a chance to see his kids. If you're seeing his kids, you're not, you're not being a good resident. I mean, that's just, that's just blatantly wrong. And I think we need to understand that and appreciate that. And I, I want everyone here to know that I know you feel that pressure and that I, for one, as the head here, that is wrong. That is incorrect. That is self-defeating. And it has caused an incredible amount of turmoil in the medical profession. We have to Dr. Tell. We all mean well, but sometimes we forget that we're the scientists. I'm talking about us in medicine. We're used to diagnose the problem, analyze it, and then prescribe treatment. So a few comments came up to me as I was listening to this. One of my very clever residents said to me the other day, she said we had compulsory lectures on burnout. We've attended three of them recently. She said, do you know, they gave us that 45 minutes since we were making it compulsory before we start the day to go to the gym or to go for a run. I would feel a lot better. Never was a true word said. This morning, I had a meeting at 7.30 at the club of committee. This was at 8 o'clock, we had a busy day in the clinic. Last six thirty, you wanted to give me a lecture, have me give them a lecture, and I told them I'm busy. They said, why don't you come and give it at 6 o'clock? This disease has spread to the point where we're just assuming that you and I, as employees of the university, will just extend that day from 5 in the morning. I've, I've bumped into Wayne Embrazier. And Wayne Embrazier is one of our wonderful administrators. He said to me, he comes into the hospital at 6.30 every morning. I remember when he used to work at the Moran here, he and I would have a cup of tea together at about 8 o'clock. It was a decent start. So I think we need to start diagnosing this and recognizing that we can't just keep on imposing upon people's time. The poor residents, we have to teach them after we finish a busy day in clinical and surgery, and we're discussing cases at 7, 8, 9 at night. There may not be any solution. What I'm telling you is the diagnosis has to come first. I'll tell you what another resident of mine said. The last two meetings she went to, they were told the solution was do more yoga and read more books. They missed the diagnosis, they missed the underlying causes. So my suggestion to administration, and to inverted commas, is listen to what people who've lived a life in different parts of medicine, perhaps different parts of the world, have to say about observations. Don't threaten them with expulsion. Don't threaten them with losing jobs. Just listen to us. So I put an editorial together last night after I spoke with Dr. Olson which I'm submitting to JAMA, which analyzes all these things that I've heard from the residents. In the last week, I had dinner with about 25 different physicians at the university, and I took on board what they said. And many of these things they're afraid to say in public or in meetings like this because of fear of retribution. So get to the diagnosis first is my suggestion, and then sort of move on. Last, last comment. Yeah. When we were building this new building, one of the things I suggested was maybe we should have a gym, so could we work such long hours we never get a chance to go anywhere. Just rush home, have a shower, go to bed. Most places in Silicon Valley, they have a gym, they have a bar, I mean, alcohol bar, they have a bar, you can have a break. Their burnout rate, I looked it up, is 8%. It's a high pressure place, Silicon Valley. Simple things like a gym in a hospital where staff can use, and I'm disappointed that our technicians are not here, we have this silly thing called excellent patient experience, and I call it silly because for a few years I've been telling anybody who listened to me, we should have two parallel lines. Excellent patient experience and excellent employee experience. Not physician, not doctor, but the burnout rate amongst technicians is higher than amongst physicians. You should listen to, I'll give you one last statistic, the number of times a technician at the Moran Eye Center is talked down to, to the point where they almost feel like weeping, is on average once a week. 
I took an informal survey about a year ago of my, all my technicians. And this is the whole week they spent with all the attendees, not just my clinic. And once a week they talked down to my patients. And I asked them, who do you go to and what do you say about him? They have nowhere to go. Excellent employee experience should run parallel to excellent patient experience. So I've just pointed to a few diagnostic criteria here. Uh, the residents always laugh at me when I, just, when I say to them, I wish there was a gym in the hospital, I could just go to it, and then I could go home, so I'm trying to drive through traffic, get to some place where the gym is closing at eight anyway. These are simple ideas, but you know, they all count. It's a, a number we, of great we points. We actually try to get a gym in here. I want people to know it. Uh, you're, you're talking to somebody who very much believes in physical fitness as a way to relieve stress. You couldn't get it to believe yourself. But uh, um, I, I, I just want people to know that People need to speak honestly about this, and I think we need to drill down. And yeah, there needs to be a change. And so I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm committed ever since Griffin and I were at the NEPO meeting and, and went over these national statistics and the rest. And I, I think it's a time for us to significantly change, and we're all going to be better for it. I agree. We'll touch on a number of these points that have been made. The, uh, um, I think, uh, I love Michael J. Fox. I just think this is, this is our, our view of the future. Um, <laughs> Looking bright, and I think this touches on Dr. Patel what you were mentioning of what uh, what is a big impairment in the culture of medicine and in a lot of our lives is it you feel like you're too busy to be well, which is so ironic, right? Like I don't have time to be happy and take care of myself, and and then in turn probably in, in, improve my productivity. And ironically, I think these are all short-term decisions we make. Like in a single day, I don't have time to fit exercise in today, um, and and that's that's that. And we look at these as all short-term decisions, but long-term, those are really unsustainable patterns. Uh, and so, um, let, me, let me jump to the survey, because uh, I think it, this is an interesting, interesting result, but um, and it kind of shows that the present is even bright at the Moran. Um, but we did this survey a year and a half ago, and then repeated it recently, because there was really poor participation the first time around, um, only 16, and this time we got about 32 out of 50 providers um, filling it out. So. The, the satisfaction rates were actually really quite good. And uh, uh, overall, this, our, our, our performance was actually much higher than most departments across the university. I think maybe the highest. Um, this question, when we did the survey a year and a half ago, maybe it was a bad time, like a rainy day or something. Because we, about out of the 16 participants, half of them said they were definitely burned out, that middle column, or worse. Um, and this time, we, we got 90% people reporting that they're not burned out or have manageable symptoms of burnout. Um, so unfortunately, as I repeat the survey, no initiative that we're going to do is going to look better than this, which is, which is probably not going to be able to measure this improvement because this is pretty good. Um, but I, I would say even the 10% that do have symptoms of burnout is not insignificant. And I think any day, our own answers to these questions would probably vary. Um, Another thing that's encouraging is uh, I feel like we have strong leadership here and the survey supported that. Um, and so there's a lot to build on going forward. Um, and healthcare teams, as we're, we've talked about a number of times today, uh, it can't be emphasized enough. I think all of our attitudes are contagious, both directions. Um, you know, burnout among staff affects patient satisfaction and the overall feeling of, of, of the clinic and then it certainly works the other way too. Um, I, I thought this was a really interesting question, um, and the answers were all over the board about the amount of stress you feel because of your job. I, I'm reminded of the Yerkes Dodson Law, which is the stress performance curve. So I think, I, I think it's kind of a loaded question to ask if you feel stress at work because, um, to some degree, stress or pressure, as you can see in this graph, is an old, old curve from like the early 1900s, um, actually increases performance because we do better with a little bit of a push. Um, uh, but there's this, there's this point where you start actually having a fall off of performance as pressure and stress increases. Um, and th that, that's where we need to be careful not to get into. And, and, I, and the question is, are those external or internal pressures um, that push us over the edge? Um, EMR, this was just a fascinating question about who's doing EMR at home. You see, so, and this is just the number of participants on the left. So 12 people say that there's almost none, and then the other about 20 spread out across, you know, being modest to excessive, mostly being moderately high. And, you know, and EMR time at home is all unfunded. 
So this is a huge contribution to uh, un, you know, un la lack of wellness. I thought this was kind of fitting. This is how some people may be feeling at least. Um, the uh, sufficiency for time, sufficiency of time for documentation, again, mostly felt like it's marginal. Um, the atmosphere we work in, again, this maybe relates to that stress slide about, uh, I think if you're calm or somewhat calm, you're probably on your administrative day. Because um, most clinics are busy, um, but we probably want to be in the busy but reasonable. If you have comments too, please shout out if, if any, of these, any of these questions. We'll have a little more discussion here, but. Another question on the survey was control over workload, which a lot of studies say is the number one factor related to wellness, uh, is the sense that people have control and autonomy over their schedule. And that was kind of all over the board, but mostly good here. <coughs> and again, another EMR question. The irony of this one is that nobody strongly disagreed that the EMR adds to frustration of their day. Um, there you go again. Um, so um, this is just who participated in the, sub in the survey at the Moran. Um, a lot of our senior partners were, uh, you know, contributed, as you can see. So we won't read through all of these, but I just wanted to highlight the, the comments that were made at the survey. So you see how many times EMR comes up in red um, as a big contributor to the lack of wellness. And then the other thing is tech, front desk, staff, scribes, um, is the set was the second most commonly mentioned um, thing. So I think, I think to, to the conclusions of the survey is that we actually are doing well. There's a strong foundation to build, to, to move forward with. and. Um, Overall, good morale, good leadership, but certainly a lot we need to do with clinics and EMR. Um, and, and those sort of things we're going to try to inc incorporate into wellness. It's a, it's a disservice to talk about wellness and say we're not going to make any administrative or structural changes because it feels like we're just trying to give out ways to cope with the, with the situation. But, but EMR, for instance, is not going away. And so there are certain things that we do have to learn to just uh, work with in a way that's more positive and healthy. So a couple of questions. I, I love this quote here. All that pushing through you do has its benefits to the world. I'm not sure what those benefits are to you. So we already asked this other first question. Are, are there any other thoughts about what is it about medicine or academic medicine that stifles wellness? Go ahead. I think there's one thing to keep in mind uh, that Dr. Olson said, you know, as far as there's, uh, there's, you gotta have a balance as far as how much intense training you go through as a trainee. I would much rather have a very intense, rigorous, you know, whatever, grueling maybe, you know, on the far end of, you know, the side of training to get, you know, really good expertise in caring for patients, you know, in whatever specialty you're in. But at the same time, you know, you can't extend, I don't think anybody would want to extend training, you know, 150% or 50, one more year, two more years to have a more luxurious kind of French take on training <laughs> No, I told you, it's, it's the principle of seasons, right? At some point, you have to say, what season am I in, and what is a reasonable balance for the season? And it changes throughout every stage of life. Having that said, you always develop habits. And I think a lot of people would agree after, I mean, I'm only, only my first year, but I'm surprised how little has changed in terms of my busyness out of residency. I still feel like things are quite busy. Uh, and so habits form, and so I think there's, it, it's not, it's, I totally agree, but we can't neglect wellness during stages of life just under the sake of this is a necessary evil for the season I'm in. Um, I remember during my fellowship, they, they said no vacation allowed during our fellowship because we just feel like you need all the time here to, uh, to get as much out of the experience. But I realized what they meant was we can't actually function our clinic without you present, so you're, we need you here every day. <laughs> the, um, but I, I, got a, I got a root canal during my fellowship and got a half day of clinic off. And as I sat down to get this root canal, I was in heaven. <laughs> lying down, just peacefully being drilled on. And we're thinking, I'm probably out of balance here <laughs> to be enjoying this so much. That was a sign to me that things were maybe not great. Uh, the, um, so, so another question, who, who, who applies these pressures on us to always be giving more of our time? Uh, always, you know, is that internal, external, both? What would you say? 
both. Well, and, and, and I, I totally agree. And I think medicine, I, I, I'm the first to admit that I've got my own neurotic tendencies to push. We're all super competitive, and we all have a tendency to compare ourselves as well, right? And success in medicine is measured by comparison. OCAPS is a percentile of how you do against your colleagues and so forth and so forth. But there's a point where that becomes really unhealthy as well. Dr. Patel? Sorry, instead of just saying where does the pressure come from, may I suggest to all of us the next time somebody says to do something in the stupid hour, which happens to me on a weekly basis, you do what I say, which is, who's going to hug my kids? And when am I going to have a shower and some breakfast? So the next time they ask me for a six o'clock meeting, I suggest we all say that to our administrators, to our bosses, to whoever. I think there should be a decent, the French have it right. I know Americans don't like the French. But the French stopped all emails after five o'clock in business. You're not allowed to send an email to me as your employee after 5 o'clock weekdays and after 5.30 on Friday. If you do, you get a fine. And the point is, they're preserving their own private time. That may be a bit extreme for aggressive capitalist America, but I think we should take <laughs> lessons from other countries. So learn to say no. And please ask in public not to be remonstrated for it. It doesn't mean you're not a team player. If a resident says to me, I can't meet you at 7 o'clock after you've done the surgery, I'm not going to say you're not a team player. I understand. There are things to do. On the other hand, I had a medical student say, can I leave your surgery at 4 o'clock because I've got a date with my wife? The answer is no, you can't. It's part of medicine. So there is a limitation to these things. So learn to say no. And you can't just say, is it internal or external? It is everywhere. And we need to learn to defend the time. I would love it if we said, Business emails, other than emergencies, should not be acted upon after, say, 6 p.m. Let's do it as an organization, Moran. You know, that was in interesting. That was mentioned at, uh, again, the AUPO, where uh, they had a big section on wellness. And somebody, and one of the chairs said that they're really working to change the culture at that institution, that emails are only sent during business hours. Um, and I thought that was, I, mean, I, think, I think that's a wonderful it's idea. Set, so you can send them at 3 in the morning. I'm talking about expecting responses. Fair, fair, fair. The people who say um, you didn't reply, and I'll say you sent it to me on Sunday. Of course that buddy didn't reply. <laughs> well, I think this, this last question here is, is what boundaries uh, do we draw to maintain or restore balance? Because I think that's a big uh, principle of wellness. Does anyone here have uh, thoughts or things that they've done to try to establish boundaries in their own life that have been healthy and helped them feel a little bit more balanced or been able to step away from work? Any thoughts? Oh, please. I have a very simple one, and it took me a long time to do it, but as a lot of you know, especially the fellows, while they were being credentialed, I answer 24-7 almost on my phone. And it got to a point where I was feeling burned out about it. I wasn't feeling that it was being appreciated. It was from the fellows, but not the whole building. And I thought, it's stressing me out, and I'm not as productive because I'm feeling irritable. So I took the notification off my mail because I would look at it and if there was even a number one there on the mail, I answered it. Now I've taken it off and it has felt a lot less stressed by that simple thing. I can deal with it when I get to work. If it's a true emergency, the residents and fellows have my phone number, they'll call me. But for as far as the email, I don't answer it after hours anymore. A great comment, Elaine. Thank you. I, it's amazing that the world still spun around before email existed. Don't be bad. Right? So, I didn't my yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob. I, I, you know, I think that uh, once you're beyond training, medical training is rigorous, is stress inducing, and I think it needs to be to get the job done. There's a time in your life when it's appropriate when you're trying to build a practice. It can be stressful, but if, you know, when you've got a family, I think carving out time to do things. I mean, what I did when my kids were home was we blocked out all their school vacations and did something as a family, except for summer break. I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> we did something. And different than the situation now, that was before the days of cell phones. And when we left town, no one ever called or contacted me. And it was wonderful. Cell phones ruined that pretty much forever. Um, I have you know, been awakened at 3 a.m. Um, in Kathmandu because it's 3 p.m. here and someone thought it was a good time to call. 
Um, those conversations are usually fairly brief. That's a lot of some time out. And, and I think that the idea of finding time, you know, whatever your schedule is, to do something physical and to try to do some meditation or yoga is important as far as trying to find some balance. You know, ultimately you have to find some balance in your life or you're gonna burn out. And so I, I think that I mean, the answer is not the same for everybody. Um, and But back to the training thing, there's no way around the fact that it's rigorous and that there's a time in your life to focus on that, do the best you can to get through everything else and ask for help if things are going off the deep end. Yeah, I agree. I mean, going back to that season principle, um, and yet, quantity of time at work doesn't always correlate to burnout. Sometimes it's the quality and the culture in which you work that makes a big difference in how you feel in the countries of burnout. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, the other part of this is the employees. In contrast, you know, our schedule, we set our own schedules, and we essentially do to ourselves as a faculty what happens to us. But nurses, classic example, who are scheduled for a certain period of time, and then they're kept over doing their charting day in and day out. I think the burnout rate is very high where it's an institutional thing, which is a little different than what the faculty does to themselves by allowing clinics to be scheduled a certain way, so many surgeries to be scheduled. You know, my schedule is my own fault, no one else's fault. And I take responsibility for that, but I, I do feel badly for those who were under institutional pressure to stay long and be part of the culture. And I think that that is one thing that needs to be paid attention to in terms of the employees. I totally agree. Uh, I do. Norm, Amy, and then we'll come here and then we'll, we'll conclude. So I, I certainly agree with everything that's been said. One thing I would add, um, you know, medicine is about things that add to wellness. Medicine is an imperfect science. Sometimes things don't go well. So I think it's important to sometimes be willing to, to talk about that if you need to talk to another colleague. I mean, we, no one is immune to that. So you could pick, pick out any one of us in this room, and we've all had more than one you know, unfortunate outcome that really hurt. And uh, so there's lots of peer support for that. And I think that sometimes you just need to hash that out. Love that comment. I think that's what we're going to hopefully use these um, in-house coaches for too, because sometimes you don't want to talk to your peers. But I think the worst thing you can do in those situations is isolate yourself, right? There's a culture of not talking about it. Interestingly, I was on a plane to APOS, uh, and a pediatric ophthalmologist from a surrounding state said to me, "Oh, you work at the Moran? I had this conversation with Norm about a complication I did, a complication that occurred from a surgery I did, and I was just panicked. And I called Norm, and he said, first of all, let me tell you how sorry I am that this happened. This, you know." I've seen this happen before. I'm sure you're just devastated about it. And she said that was, number one, one of the most healing things about it. So it's interesting that you said that, uh, Norm. Amy, and then we'll go and or, or, Amy, and then we'll go to Dr. Tell. Very quickly, I think that when we talk about self-care and de-stress, we often think that it has to take a lot of time. And if anybody is panicking about, oh my gosh, I need to schedule a week vacation, or I need to take a half day of clinic off, some of these things can be about carving out, like Dr. Hoffman said, carving out time and space, doing the routines of things that you already have to do. We all have to use the restroom at some point during the day. We all have to wash our hands before we examine a patient. And you can make some of those times and some of those things your own. So start with one minute a day. Start with 60 seconds. It has a great benefit on the other side. And some of the 15-minute the de-stress group that Lisa talked about, we can 
can explore some ways to be able to do that. So we don't have to think big right now. We can start very small. But in have had some very deep and meaningful discussions with the residents. Usually, unfortunately, late in the evening, but the clinics and surgeries are over. But they don't, I don't carry any power. I can't power any fire. So they speak very freely. And I've learned a lot from what they say. No, none of the residents have spoken up today. I mean, if we have a 75 percent burnout rate amongst residents, we should encourage them to speak freely and discuss with us, maybe informally. They don't want to put their hand up in a meeting like this. That's where I've learned a lot about what they feel, what things can be done differently. And I've said to them, why don't you say it out loud when we have these meetings? And they become very coy. They're afraid to stick their neck out. That's that spirit that Dr. Olson was talking about. Know, take it on the chin, don't complain. And God knows I saw that in my early years over here in my fellowship. So I think it's important for us to encourage the residents to speak to us informally and not hold their feet to the fire. This is what they have to say. Creating a safe environment Absolutely. where things can say. Go ahead, last comment, and then we need to go. So um, I don't want to take a lot of time here, from, but I, you know, what, one of the things that has occurred to me, historically we've been able to kind of put ourselves in medicine and get our satisfaction from being in medicine. And being in the private community and trying to um, be in that environment, it's it's difficult. It's a little bit different than academics in a way that a lot of the times bigger academic organizations are run by doctors and understand some of the pressures that we, we experience as doctors. A lot of times in managed care organizations where a lot of our a lot of us are shifting towards, we have administrators who are businessmen and they don't get us, they don't understand it. Even my own spouse doesn't get what I have to go and have to carry on a day to day. And in a sense, they have, in my experience, we have been approached as we're expendable, we're replaceable, and we can just be changed out. It doesn't matter. You know, they, don't, they treat us in such a way that it doesn't really, it doesn't matter. The, the lack of appreciation and, and then everything else is, is really difficult to carry. And I think that as we, some of us in this room, especially with residents, may be turning out to the more non-academic, more private world, it's one of those things that medicine is changing as we've integrated um, CEOs and businessmen into medicine, I think it's, it's about the ability to, to really kind of understand and, and control the burnout. And I wonder a little bit if some of that burnout is coming from that um, and, and community as a whole. Because I talked to some of my friends, and I've been out for seven years now, and a lot of them are experiencing the same things that I'm experiencing too. So that's just another thought to kind of talk about. An, an important point to, to always remain an advocate. Well, I think we'll end there because I don't want to keep anyone.